Welcome to the Women Living Well After 50 podcast. I'm Sulon Carrick and I'm passionate about inspiring, motivating, supporting and informing women over 50 to embrace this exciting time of life. Health and wellness in mind, body and spirit are the foundations for living well, but there is so much more to a life well lived. Each week through conversations with my guests, I'll be presenting topics that will help us all to live well and enjoy life. So join me as we discover new ways to become women living well after 50. Are you ready to start living? What are you waiting for? Let's get started. I'm delighted that you're joining me for another episode of Conversations with Women Living Well After 50. Reclaiming Life. I recently wrote a blog post, Discover Yourself by Becoming an Explorer. As women, we represent many different roles in life, such as partner, mother, carer, daughter, sister, friend, the list goes on. And this can really confuse our true identity. And because we're busy wearing so many hats all of the time, we can lose sight of who we are as an individual. As Roy T. Bennett says, do not let the roles you play in life make you forget who you are. So today I'm delighted to introduce my guest, Dr. Catherine Hansen, to discuss the principles behind reclaiming life with a focus on midlife women's wellness. After 20 years practicing in medicine, Dr. Hansen decided that she wanted to expand beyond the office walls to help women rediscover the inner peace and outer joy of reclaiming life. With hot and juicy information to share, she gives Uh, engaging presentations on topics that no one wants to cover but everyone needs to know. She's been interviewed with multimedia outlets, runs a woman-to-woman column, shares a revealing wellness blog and has created several community and online programs that reach out with powerful, usable, safe and effective health and wellness information for women of all ages and stages in life. Dr. Hansen has completed a residency in obstetrics and gynaecology, followed by a fellowship of sexual health, a certification in menopause and strong alignment with an integrative approach to care. After realizing her strong desire to educate, she completed a master of public health at Johns Hopkins University and has witnessed life-changing results as a certified transformational coach and facilitator. Married to Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen, Catherine is blessed with uh, three amazing teenagers. The entire family enjoys outdoor life, night swimming and watching for satellites among the stars. So let's go and join the conversation. Welcome, Catherine, and it's so lovely to have you join me in conversation today. We've been working, we've known each other for quite some time and we've been working to get together for an interview. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today. And thank you for giving me your time. Yeah, me too, Sue. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I'm honoured that you asked. And I'm really excited about this chat. Me too. Okay, so in my introduction, I mentioned that um, women wear many hats in life. And it's so easy for us to lose sight of who we are as an individual. So I'd like to chat today to you about ways that we can reclaim our life, especially after 50. So what I want to do is start with the first question, which is simply, where do we start in our journey to reclaim our life? Yeah, absolutely. And it's always taking that first step that is uh, the hardest I think um, sometimes we have to even go back a step and be motivated enough and think that we are important enough to actually reclaim our life. Um, but the first piece is always that inner, inner relationship. So just taking that moment or many moments to check in with ourselves to figure out what's going on around us that has us pulled in a million directions, wearing all those hats. And we so often walk through our life in a fog, not really, not really knowing what it is that we want or that we desire or that we yearn for. And that inner relationship really needs to be cultivated. And I always start with 
reclaim, rediscover yourself, really get to know the yummy parts of you that, that you have forgotten about or that you may not be paying attention to. And I have to say, I have seen you do this. I have watched how you really step back and you have this beautiful ability to check in with yourself. And if you want to pull away or you need to pull away, you do. And when you're ready and when you, know, you check in and you know that it's time, you strive forward. So I think you're a, a phenomenal role model for us to be watching how you're, how you're having that, that conversation with yourself. Is this good for me right now or not? Well, thank you for those lovely words. But I, I agree that, um, you know, we get so busy and it's really only been later in life that I've sort of taken the time uh, to probably overcome some limiting beliefs and just really start to connect with myself. And, uh, you know, I'm fortunate, I suppose, that I do have a bit more time when you're younger and you've got the family to look after and things like that. It, it can be difficult, but it's so important for women of all ages to get to know who they are and, you know, remember what they used to enjoy in life and perhaps they're not doing it now. Um, and why aren't they doing it now? We can, I think for a lot of women, we feel guilty about taking time out for ourselves and also to actually take time to communicate with ourselves. So, you know, do you agree with that, that guilt plays a big part? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're we're raised, you know, society and all these external expectations and, and our, our family of origin or wherever those thoughts came from, you mentioned limiting beliefs and we all have those limiting beliefs, which, which keeps us striving for our self-worth in so, you know, so many different ways. And it's not until uh, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, really hit a wall or, or become overwhelmed or even burnt out when they realize this just isn't worth it anymore. And I like to think that women at all ages and stages, you, you know, really not, don't put your life on hold, really realizing that even though there's young children or even though your partner may need you or even though work obligations are front of mind your life is your life it's so precious and to be lived the richness and the joy of it you know regardless of what other things are going on you're the only one that's going to be able to say this is what I need now. And I just want to make one other comment on that is that when we end up feeling really stressed and really burnt out, we, we can reclaim what is ours, but we also need to employ uh, the people around us and be ready to negotiate that, you know, these are my needs. And if we can you know, understand where that guilt is coming from and have those open conversations with the people around us. We really can't do self-care by ourselves, especially mm. if we're in relationship with others. So really being able to set aside the guilt you're talking about, being able to understand the limiting beliefs and, and getting people in our corner so that we can be out living happy, healthy, fulfilled lives. Yes, and that's such an important point that you said about self-care isn't just about being our responsibility or right. um, asking help. And I think for many of us, we haven't actually had the discussion with those around us about what our needs and desires are. So if they don't know and they aren't aware, they can't support us in what we want or what we need. So I think that that's an excellent point that you've raised about being open and just putting it out there saying, this is what I need, this is what I can de desire, what can you do to help me achieve that as well? So that's a great point. So thanks for that. 
Now, mm. I want to move on to another area that you work in. You work with women of all ages, uh, but in particular, you do a lot of work with peri and postmenopausal women. Now, I've been there, so I know that it can be a very stressful mm -hmm. time um, of life for us and our bodies are changing, the hormones are all over the place. So what are some of the questions uh, that women ask you to help with uh, during this time of life so that they can achieve the life they want? Yeah, great, great question. And so I am a board certified OBGYN and, and yeah. have license in both US and Canada. So uh, seeing women all the time of all ages and stages, but I just, really have a passion for women who are reaching midlife. And, and I'm with you, I've been there too. And I wanna clarify a couple of things because people will say, oh, menopause, I did that already. But I, I believe that this whole aspect of midlife and beyond is really where we're coming into ourselves. You know, we talked about, we can set aside the guilt, we can put ourselves first, we can reclaim life. And for whatever reason, it's such a vital time in a woman's life. Now, perimenopause and some of those menopausal symptoms can last for 10 years. We call that the climacteric. So coming up to the hormonal changes that occur and menopause itself, of course, is just that, that year mark after the last menstrual period. So these definitions, you know, they all kind of get blurred. But the work I do with midlife women and the questions they ask are really interestingly, I just want to get these symptoms out of my way so I can get back to business. Yeah. And the, you know, they'd love to come in and have me, you know, just dust them off and send them back on their way. And this is where we come back to the first part of our conversation, which is this is potentially a wake up call. This is an opportunity to reclaim your life. We can manage hot flashes and night sweats and insomnia and vaginal symptoms that I think we may talk about today and all of those things happening. And we can certainly treat from a conventional medical point of view by replacing hormones, for example, or using non-hormonal management. There are a lot of uh, uh, tricks up a gynecologist's sleeve to, to help with those symptoms. Happy to go into that in greater detail as you guide me. But what's really important is for us to see that we're, we're not just a body that needs the fixing or the medicine, that we're really a uh, connected. We're a body, mind, and soul. And some testament to that, uh, which is really interesting because I always like, like to kind of put the backstop of science behind almost everything I say, if, if that's possible. Some things we don't have science for, but we know that women who are expecting their menopause to be good and for it to be a positive time in their life, they actually have less physical menopausal symptoms. Mm. And we know that women who, who know they can manage their symptoms through say non-medical means or they have uh, other coping mechanisms, they do really, really well. And so that tells us that we have this ability to be a body, mind and soul connected as we're stepping into treatment. Um, so I think that, it, you know, it's really just important for us to know that this is something we're likely all going to face. We know that over half of women will have these symptoms that some of them can be incapacitating. And, and the final thought on some of the symptoms, for example, vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes and night sweats, we're now starting to understand that those can be an indicator of underlying medical conditions. So really not to ignore, not to uh, grit our teeth and push through these symptoms, but to really understand our body, again, check in with ourselves, see if we're pushing too hard, see what we need to help us feel better and reach out for help so that we can get all, access to all of those aspects of care. Mm. Yeah, I love that idea about the connection with mind, body and spirit, because I think that, um, you know, we tend to just look at the physical side of things in many ways. And and I know for me that exercising really helped me. I, I was, that's, I started running at 50 
And, um, you know, I found for me, and I've got friends now who are in that stage, early stages of menopause, and they feel the same, that the exercise has really helped them to cope. Doesn't mean that you don't get symptoms, but I think you're right too about the um, your mindset. If you've got, if you look at menopause as part of life and it's going to happen and and you just try to cope with it as best you can, getting advice, seeking treatment if you need it, you can make it a little bit easier. But I I do know that some women suffer terribly with it and it, it can affect you mentally. Then I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to touch on a, a couple of the um, areas that, well, firstly, intimacy and sexual pain. Now, you know, that we can have a, a an intimate and a pleasurable sex life well after 50. But I think that because we, you know, our bodies are changing and you talked about vaginal dryness before, um, we sort of, it affects us. We, we don't feel as sexy. We don't feel comfortable during sex. And for a lot of women, they give up and that can actually affect your relationship, can't it? So mm. I'd like to talk about um, your thoughts on that and, and just a little bit of advice generally that you would give to women who have these issues. Yeah, absolutely. So with respect to continuing happy, healthy sex life, we know that the vast majority of women continue having very happy sex lives all the way till say 65, that would be the majority. So over 60%, then it drops to around 40% of women up to the age of 75. And then it drops to about 20% of women up to the age of 85. So we've got 85 year old women, 20%, let's say one in five of them still out there having a wonderful sex life. Mm -hmm. And I have seen it in the office many times, you know, I'll have 80 year old women come in who have just met a partner and they're wanting to get things back on track. And they're really over the moon excited about this sexual aspect. So it, it's exceptionally reassuring. And especially in this day and age where women are really take reclaiming their life, they're taking yeah. back that control. And so I, I, I want to make sure that people know, because this isn't something we talk about much. I want people to know that this is an area of life that can continue as long as we want it to. And I think some of the drop in the numbers is because women are outliving men. And so women are, you know, at those stages, sometimes without a partner and even um, unpartnered women are still having happy, healthy sex lives. So the, the, the questions around what is stopping women if they want to have a sex life that's you know, healthy and vivacious, it, oftentimes it can be pain or discomfort. And we know around the time of menopause, around 50, average age is 50, 51, um, and then usually takes about five maybe five to seven years after that for the vaginas to, to start to really be impacted by that lack of estrogen. So women can go through menopause all fine. Okay, my hot flashes are gone, everything's great. And then their vagina and their bladder start to hurt and they don't really understand what it is. And that's because the tissues now taken that long to change. So I wanna be very clear that hormones are now thought to be very safe in a lot of women. And so if women are questioning symptoms around hot flashes, night sweats, and vaginal dryness, there are ways to administer hormones with your healthcare provider. And the science is really reassuring for us that if you're in that category of women that need that, definitely have those conversations with your healthcare provider. But there are things we can do in the vagina specifically vaginal estrogen or, or non-hormonal lubricants. So lubricants we use during the sex cycle, during yeah. the sex yeah. play, or lubricants that we can get uh, from the drugstore that are more moisturizer based that go in regularly, but they don't have hormone in them. And then of course, vaginal hormones. And there are some even some really kind of interesting treatments that we can take orally, but that they focus on the vaginal tissue. So if you really don't want to put anything in your vagina, there are ways to do that 
and treat your vagina purely with a pill that goes in your mouth. Um, but I think that's all the medical side of it. And again, there's the body, mind, and spirit aspect yeah. where a couple um, really ebb and flow in their relationship. And this sexual aspect is a real barometer of the relationship and the glue that can stick a long-term committed intimate relationship together for a very long time. And I just encourage people to be creative and to keep dialogue open. And for women, especially who have thought this is a taboo topic, now is the time to be reclaiming that aspect of life and having those open conversations, knowing what you need, knowing how to ask for what you need, knowing how to share openly with your partner. Because if, for example, intercourse is not possible or not comfortable or needs help, there's so many other aspects of sexual intimacy that can continue. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice. And it does come down to communication, not just with your partner, but also with uh, perhaps your um, doctor uh, or someone, you know, someone like yourself who is who specialises in menopause and uh, just feeling comfortable with who you are and what you want. And that's something that perhaps women of my generation, I'm in my 60s now, um, perhaps weren't brought up that way. So it can be difficult to change the way you've been brought up, but you can do it. So mm -hmm. thank you for that little bit of information there because you're right, some women still feel it's a taboo subject. So I like to put that out on the table there for everyone to feel comfortable with and to be informed. So the next area I do wanna talk about is something that I struggle with. Uh, and I know that many women do, and that's sleep and stress. Now, mm. I think they're probably both um, connected, but I'd like to know your thoughts on or any tips on how we can improve our sleep and ways that you think we can reduce stress. And I know the information's out there. We probably all know it, but um, I'd just like to get your thoughts on uh, what you say to your clients. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I, I always, you know, I always like to start with the education piece. And I know the information is out there, you know, stress is real. And it has, you know, that stress effect is a physical effect. So when we feel stressed, or we feel that tightness, those neurotransmitters and hormones in our body are actually having health effects on us. And it would be the same for sleep deprivation. We know that when we don't get enough sleep, our body hasn't gone through the healing process and we haven't been able to lay down the memories and we can have you know, brain fog or, or, or even worse uh, health effects. We know diabetes or heart disease, these things are worse for people who don't sleep or don't get the sleep that they need or aren't able to manage the stress. So these things that we talk about sleep and stress and we kind of throw them around like you know things that that uh, it would be nice to have are vital for us to be working mm -hmm. toward, you know, real, uh, real deep restorative sleep and, and a way to manage stress. So there's so many ways, you know, to manage stress and your right information is out there. I would, I would say, if I were to have to give one thought around what would be a really great place to like drop in the bucket and see the ripple effect, it, it would have to be a relaxation or a meditation response. We know from the, from the 1970s, uh, there was a Harvard professor, um, what's his name, Herbert Benson, and he wrote the relaxation response. And, and every book about meditation and relaxation beyond that has, has related to that. We know that if we can put our body into a relaxation response for even five minutes a day, this doesn't have to be hard, we get a lowering of blood pressure, we get a lowering of heart rate, we get, you know, a healing of our tissues, we get more oxygen to our brain. And so I, I have a meditation practice. And that's what I encourage people to do. But if that's not comfortable, just a relaxation, just a chance to, to be calm, to allow all that tension to release, even a walking practice. And I'm sure for you, running is one of those relaxation practices because it's something you enjoy and do so well. 
And if we do that, we also know, I, I like to look at everything that I kind of measure, the diet, the exercise, the sleep, the stress, all of those things through the lens of longevity, because there's things that we can do, you know, that would help us right here and now, but, but there's, when we measure things through longevity, we sometimes get different answers. You know, the food that we would eat for weight loss is not necessarily the food we would eat for, lo for longevity. Um, same with exercise and those things. And, and so for meditation, a meditation practice, we know that it actually lengthens the telomeres, which are the caps on our DNA, which actually allows us to heal our DNA, which allows us to restore and potentially add years to our life. So I, again, love the science piece of this, but a very, very regular, even five minutes relaxation or meditation practice is gonna make a world of difference. Now, I also think that may help with sleep, but if I were to say, what is the one thing in addition to those other wellness aspects I would add for sleep? It really is a religious sleep, sleep hygiene. And you know we can have a back and forth about what areas that we could tweak with uh, some of your sleep, but you're so well educated in the area of wellness. I'd be surprised if there's very much that we can uh, up level. But sleep hygiene, really going to the bed to bed at exactly this, almost exactly the same time every day, getting up at the same time every day. The exercise you do is also going to help you be want to be more rested um, for night. I know if I have even one glass of red wine, I'm going to have a disrupted sleep. Bottom mm. line, I know it. It's a trade-off for me. So sometimes it's worth it and other times yes. it's not. So we, we really, as you get to know your body, check in with your body, really understand those things, those routines, the personal answers as to what it is I need that's going to make this just a little bit better. And if we're going to talk about menopause and sleep, we know that that drop in hormones really disrupts sleep around that, you know, the few years around menopause and menopausal hormone therapy is one of the best ways to hit all those symptoms, including sleep at the same time. Mm. And again, I like your point about, I suppose, communicating with ourselves and working out what's right for us because we get so much information, uh, but because we're all individual and our bodies work differently, we have to find that pattern or that that way that uh, or the things that will help us as individuals. You, we can take information from different sources, but sometimes it's a matter of trial and error. And you just say, well, you know, they suggested this would work, but it didn't work for me. So I need to really see try something else so it is a big issue sleep and yeah uh, yeah yep. it changes over time in our life too so what worked once you know isn't necessarily what's going to work for us now so it's constantly checking in mm -hmm. okay so I'm excited to be talking about my next topic with you and um, I met you through uh, the empowered women's circle uh, and that's something that is very dear to you that you started. And you actually wrote a, a great menopause series for my blog a, a couple of years ago. So um, I'll put the links to those again because I'm sure that they're still relevant. And uh, it was really a great series that you wrote on that. But the Empowered Women's Circle, I'm really interested in you explaining to the listeners what that is and, and why you started it. And then I'd like to move on to your new, your course, your five week Reclaim Your Life course. So let's start with the Empowered Women's Circle first. Why did you start it and what is it all about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Empowered Women's Circle is very near and dear to me. And uh, I, I'm excited that you can share the, the menopause series again. So 20 over 20 years of, of being in the office with women and really realizing that the short visit, the time that I was seeing them, I wasn't really able to answer all their questions and provide all that education, really equip them to be living their best lives. And I also realized that there is a lot of uh, really 
um, I want to say crazy information. There's a lot of uh, not, you know, not necessarily credible information out there. So as I sent women on their way to access information to answer problems and solve, you know, their symptoms and, and uh, get their life back on track, I was sort of sending them off and not really knowing where they would go. We search the internet and we come up with all kinds of things and people are selling stuff and giving stuff away. And I was really overwhelmed myself trying to uh, negotiate all of that. So I imagined that women were as well. And so I realized that I wanted there to be credible science-backed information available for women for all of these health and wellness questions, especially around midlife wellness and relationship intimacy. And I also realized as women were coming in the office that they would sit down with me and, and it, it was kind of a, a bit of a not funny joke that mostly women would cry in the office. And, and if I didn't make a woman cry, I knew I quit, hadn't quite had the depth of conversation that we, that we could have. So I always had Kleenex available. But the big question women would ask was, am I the only one? And I would, I would almost, you know, after years of doing this, I would want to take them to the waiting room and have, you know, have the whole rest of the waiting room just say to them, you know, you're not the only one because the next person that comes in is going to have similar concerns and questions. And if the questions are different, that sense of isolation is still the same. And the, the empowered women circle stemmed out of wanting to help with credible wellness information and wanting women to know they weren't alone with a lot of these challenges that we as women negotiate. And the third reason that really came as the empowered women circle started to come together, it's been, it's going on four years now, is that women are stronger together. And so myself having a conversation with a woman, I'm able to, to, you know, lift and support her. But when there's you know, 20 or 50 women or 100 or 1000 women around her who are also just allowing her to step into her brilliance and encouraging her to up level life or to change something or to shift something uh, or to not feel guilty about something. And it, she's got that uplift of the women around her. And that is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you, you know, how do you run the women's, uh, sorry, the empowerment women's circle? What, mm -hmm. what happens with that? Do they, is it through a Facebook group or is it through meetings? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I suppose physically it's a bit hard with COVID, but um, is, yeah, how do they, what format does it take? Yeah, it, it, it started, it's, I guess, very interesting. One of the silver linings of this pandemic, it started with in-person circles and we would get together in person. So I'm in Houston and I had uh, uh, several other wellness leaders around. So I had what I would call sister circles and we would have our physical circle, but we would be virtually visiting with other circles. And uh, it, it worked very well and we grew that way and, and uh, established a lot of relationships that way. And then when the pandemic hit, we realized we still had each other and we were still growing and we could bring more friends. We could actually invite people who wouldn't be otherwise able to attend an in-person circle from all over the world. And so we do it virtually now. And I want to make sure that women have access. So we have a free, uh, I'm going to say public circle, the, the website ewcircle.com has resources that are accessible. And we have a private but free Facebook group. And I share things in there. And we do Zoom call, like Zoom community. I try not to leave um, as great as Facebook is for community, I try not to leave everything in there. I try to make sure that we have uh, community access outside. So we've got yes. Zoom and uh, we have other ways that we meet and share information, uh, email information, and I will get together with people live to, you know, for example, uh, this coming Friday, I'm doing a, a talk with that big community on uh, sex and sustainability because it's February and it's about relationships and we're going to be talking about that you know elaborating on what you and I have talked about in terms of the importance of intimacy 
in, in holding relationships together. And that's this Friday, and that will be in the Facebook group um, as a way of having that community. And then I have a paid membership. So uh, a smaller group of women who are looking for greater resources. And with them, we get together once a week. And I would call that group coaching. And mm -hmm. we have a process, a blossoming process that we go through together. So there's weekly um, stepping stones for us to be doing together and com conversation topics for us to have. And we just, uh, we really work in our own lives and then come together to, to help with that accountability and loving support of each other. So there's mm. those both aspects of the Empowered Women Circle. Yeah, I love the concept of it because uh, to me, women are supportive of each other. And, um, you know, if you, if you are going through some struggles, if you're in a safe environment where you feel you can talk about things, they will be the first to support you and, and help you. So it's a great concept. How did you find going from the physical meetings to the virtual meetings? I know that for me, I, you know, Zoom, I just feel like you and I are in the same room having a conversation, but some women or people struggle with the virtual uh, format. But I, I think the positive would be that you could reach more women that way. But um, mm. have you had any feedback on what people prefer? I think that some of our, our original, we call them our original gangsters. So some of our original women, you know, who really want to be putting their arms around each other um, are really missing that. But I'll be honest, Sue, I, I love the virtual format. I huh. really do. It, I feel so, you know, I'm in my home environment, but I, you know, I can, um, I think the value of women is so much of what we communicate is nonverbal, huh. you know, a good, the studies say a good 75% of what we communicate is nonverbal. And when, when we're talking about these limiting beliefs and we're talking about what's holding us back and how we're facing challenges, but um, we're not really sure where to go next, other women, as you say, will be the first ones to, to create that space for us before we're even able to step into it ourselves. They really hold space for us to be a bigger version of ourselves than we do on our own. And in that virtual format, I have noticed the, the depth of connection between women that would probably physically not even be able to be together. Yeah. They're in different states or even different countries, and yet they have so much of an energetic connection and so much care and compassion for each other that the, the, the depth of the relationship and the conversations that we're able to have and touch into uh, has been profound, mm. really profound. Mm. I think that this has allowed us to come together in uh, in deeper ways, in more frequent ways, and I'm hoping that we can continue to expand on the 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 blessings uh, of the pandemic. You know, really pulling out the pieces yeah. that maybe uh, have made things you know better for us, more accessible for us. Yes, and that's the important thing too. I mean, I know people are still struggling with lockdowns and restrictions and. It's, it's certainly been a very stressful and difficult time for the world. But mm. uh, I do think, too, that sometimes you've got to try and focus on the positives as well. And mm. what I've found is that people have become so creative in, OK, we're in lockdown. What can we do? I've got a friend and she's um, been in lockdown for probably a year now. And uh, she's just found that she can, and, and because she's quite a social person, um, she's found that by joining groups online, um, book clubs, and uh, she, you know, does cooking with her, um, you know, cooking online and, and different activities, it's made her think outside the box of how can I still live when I have these restrictions on me? And she's a great inspiration to me because she, you know, hasn't, it, it certainly has affected her, but she's overcome that to try and say, well, this is the situation, what can I do? And everybody learning Zoom, everybody um, becoming used to the virtual world and embracing that, I think that's really been 
one of the good things we, of, about having to have gone through that um, experience over the last year. So let's move on to oh, go on. I, I, and on the on the on the pandemic. I just I can't help but mention the fact that it it really connects the world. Yes, it, we're all experiencing something, and the the trauma and the the tragedy has been you know palpable the world over, and every single human being on the face of the earth is currently impacted and and connected. We're connected by our biology. Mm. And that has never been more prevalent in my lifetime. I, I, I think that uh, there is so much to learn from this and there's going to be ramifications, you know, on definitely on the negative side. But as you say, I, I hope that we can see the silver threads in what we're experiencing as a yeah. common humanity. Yeah. Now that leads me to the next thing that's quite exciting and that's your five week reclaim your life course because we've been talking about reclaiming your life and you know we've touched on a few subjects today not in great depth because of time and I'd love to have you back uh, for some future episodes to perhaps just take one topic and, and devote the time to that. Uh, but tell me a little bit about reclaim your life the course, because I think that that's where you would go into quite a bit of detail. Mm -hmm. So reclaim your life. Uh, it's reclaim your life, a doctor's guide to health and vitality for the awakening woman. And it was developed ultimately for the same reasons the empowered women's circle was developed credible content and information women, you know, needing to know they're not alone in their challenges and concerns and the power of of reclaiming and, and bringing women together and just the, the, common, the common rising, you know, that we're experiencing in the world with women today. So Reclaim Your Life is five weeks. It's rediscover you, renew you, a new you, make a plan because we need to take it to real tangential lifestyle change and a blueprint for success. So that's the five modules. And it's the reason that it's, um, I'm so excited about it and I'm, I'm grateful that we're chatting about it today is because for the first time, I've been running the program for several years now, but for the first time it's digitally available. Another offshoot of COVID, um, of the pandemic, is that it is now available for people to walk through and to experience and to, uh, to, to access in an entirely digital format. And as women do that, I can reach out to them to make sure that they're well supported and get what they need. So mm -hmm. thank you for asking about it. And I hope that, you know, we can definitely come back together and talk about any other aspect of it that we want to elaborate on. Yeah, sure. And what I'll be doing, uh, by the way, is also putting the links to what we've talked about today, your website, um, the Empowered Women's Circle information and the information on your five-week uh, Reclaim Your Life course in the show notes so that people can connect with you. And I'd certainly recommend that because uh, I've learned so much from you over the time and uh, you certainly have a lot to offer and you have this lovely way of presenting. It, you're just so lovely and calm and... and um, welcoming and we haven't chatted together before we've really only been on email or you know that way but um, it's just I feel like we've been friends for ages so it's been really great to have you mm -hmm. uh you. so Thank before you. me too I feel like sometimes I walk on the beach with you <laughs> with some oh. of your videos I feel like you know we could dip our toes in the in the ocean at some point together I hope that happens yeah especially um well you said you were in Houston did you just have that terrible time with the um loss of power and the snow in Texas for the first time in 40 years or something so we we did we did and I'm a Canadian living in Houston so I know snow but this little winter storm took the entire city down yeah yes. yeah well I like to show you my beach uh photos or videos so that you can feel as if you're here anyway because it's hot and humid where I am today 
so look, finally, before we go, uh, I'd like to ask you a question which I ask all of my guests, and that is, what does being a woman living well mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am over 50 and I want to just say thank you so much for the community that you've developed because I feel like I'm not embarrassed to say I'm over 50. I'm excited to be part of the group that is, uh, you know, really taking life back and, and putting themselves on the list. And that's what I sense is happening in your community and what you're role modeling for us. So what does it mean to be a woman living well over 50? For me, it means being in my life to be experiencing the richness and the joy of this one life that I have to reclaim it and to, to really uh, allow myself to, to be in it, to take decisions, to make decisions, to take actions every day that allow me to be experiencing and intentional about how my life is shaping up. Yeah, that's perfect. I love the way you're saying about having an, a daily intention and, and taking the time to think about how your life is today and how it, you want it to be. So um, so that's, that's really great. Thanks for sharing that with me. And what I love is with all my guests, I get a different answer. So I'm building up quite a little a um, uh, list of uh, different ways of women are living well. And that's great because we're all individuals and we all have different ideas and, and different ways that we look at things in life. So, so thank you for that. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you for joining me again today, uh, Catherine. It's been a joy to uh, spend time with you and to talk about your work and uh, your advice that you've given us today. As I mentioned, I'll be putting the information in the show notes and uh, for people who, who want to contact you, which would be, be wonderful. And I want to say thank you for the listeners for joining us today in conversation. Don't forget to uh, leave me a like or a comment or subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss a conversation. And just remember to live life and enjoy life every day. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.